I, I was listening to uh, National Public Radio this morning, and as uh, some of you might know, the Iraqi Prime Minister, Nouri al-Malaki, is in Washington, D.C., and one of the um, things that he's trying to do is to talk to Congress, our Congress, to provide additional support to um, his country um, to help shore up security and to help address um, growing security threats. And in an interview with um, one of our senior senators, John McCain, John McCain said, we listened to him and we said, yes, we are happy to think, to consider your requests, but what we need is a strategy. That's what um, John McCain said yesterday. And what, and what he meant is exactly what we've been discussing here, that the budget is nothing or should be nothing less than a translation of your national security strategy into numbers. Because how you spend your money, how you choose to allocate it, the extent of oversight that you provide to those resources, and the mechanisms that you use to evaluate them speak volumes about how serious you are about national security strategy and how effective the strategy is going to be in itself. And so as we discuss budgeting and procurement today, let us think about it within the context of um, Professor Dempsey's discussion this morning about national security strategy, and all we discussed in module one about leadership and ethics, because it all comes down to what is the critical strategic decision that you are going to make, that your countries are going to make, as it relates to the management of you know, increasingly scarce resources. And budgeting and procurement um, is um, central in this discussion. But you can't talk about budgeting, procurement anywhere in the world without talking a little bit about corruption, and particularly corruption in the security sector. I have a very brief um, presentation. I'll be skipping a, a, a number of slides. But I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about you know, how you define corruption. We've had a lot of discussion over the week about what, what is or what is not, what is, or is, or is not corruption. Um, <coughs> excuse me, talk you through the, um, a recent index by Transparency International on defense corruption, um, look at the impact or implications for security and the success of your security strategy um, as relates to corruption, and then we would be remiss if at the end of We'll be remiss if at the end of our discussions we don't provide you with some examples of how we can do things better. So what is corruption? Um, we've asked a number of people what corruption is or what it is not. And um, I've, had, I've talked to um, a lawyer, and uh, this lawyer works on um, you know, corporate bonds, et cetera, and says it's basically a violation of the arm's length principle. So I, have no, I don't have a clue what that means. <laughs> but it basically means, I think basically suggests that um, you know, if you are dealing in your official capacity, you don't mix the official and the personal. Um, an Eastern European government official gave the last one that corruption is a natural part of our lives. It helps us solve many problems. Um, my favorite is the first one. I think it basically is an impairment of integrity, okay, for financial, social, political, or economic gain. Because the whole thing about strategic leadership and the ethical dimension we've been discussing is all about your personal integrity. And you might, and I'll probably have time to give a few examples of how this plays out. There are a number of different types of um, um, corruption you're likely to encounter, both personally, as in you are either approached or you at times would initiate, or in the workplace. And there are a lot of debates about, you know, what is corruption, what is not corruption. Well, there are a number of questions that I would challenge you to ask yourselves in trying to decipher the gray areas. Um, 
And, these, and this is a list of some of those questions. And if the answers to any, uh, the answers to these questions will help you decide from a personal integrity perspective um, whether or not this is something that you'd want to classify as corruption or whether or not it's something that is not. Because I think my point here is that it's not very easy to have black or white. There's a huge gray area in between. And there are a number of questions that could help you in um, working through this. If, we dis if, we, if our point of departure is, and also for those of you who um, probably have not been on GlobalNet lately, um, the copies of all presentations are available on GlobalNet the day after, or maybe one, uh, one or two days after, so um, you, you, you could download these. But I mention that because I wanted, I wanted to um, highlight the website. This is the Transparency International Government Corruption in the Defense Sector Index. What they have is they've looked at 82 countries. And in those 82 countries, they looked at five risk areas for corruption. Political corruption, financial corruption, personnel corruption, operations, and procurement corruption. And in those five areas, in these five areas, they asked, they have 29 subcategories of issues. And they grade each country on those 29 um, issues, and they add them up to show the extent of corruption in the security sector. They then add up all the um, responses, and this is what they came up with. Grades from A, meaning really good, through F. And you could see that most of the African countries are on the wrong side of the scale, um, scored very badly. And this is because of a number of things. But one, particularly in the, um, when you're looking at the, uh, what's it called now? Political corruption. One of the issues that they raised that I think is critical for most of our countries is the ability of the, legislature, the um, legislative branch to understand defense budgets and supervise defense budgets. Most African countries scored really, really poorly there. Also, another area where they scored poorly is that there's no mechanism in most defense establishments for people to be able to raise issues and get them corrected. There's no mechanism in, 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 in most African countries. And this just gives an idea of where, how far. This report was released about four weeks ago. Uh, but this just shows how much work needs to be done on the African continent, and particularly in the security sector. Because if I, if I were to repeat a, a point I made earlier, if the budget and the way we treat it is basically a translation of our national security aspirations into numbers, then security in African countries um, really does not have, particularly looking at security in a human security, from a human security perspective, doesn't seem to have a chance because we are not doing well on all of the five points that the Transparency International um, governance in defense, um, defense sector task force looked at. OK, so what does this mean um, for um, the issues we, uh, that we are discussing? Um, we know that you see corruption at the center. And we're talking about this within the context of national security. And national security has a military dynamic. It has a governance dynamic and has a development dynamic. I could talk about all three, but just focus on the issues raised in the military side. What um, corruption does in the military um, sector. And everything that we have been discussing in terms of strategy, effectiveness of our, of, um, our strategies to attain objectives, interoperability, 
being reasonably equipped. I remember there was one country, um, which I will not name, and uh, I worked on this country in the late 80s. And this country was, about, was going to purchase um, equipment for a new electricity um, plant, an electricity generation plant, the new turbines. And the minister for energy of that country went to Europe and purchased a new turbine, well, a brand new second-hand turbine. And this turbine came back. Within two weeks of being installed, it broke down. Why? The electricity plant for that country is located by the, co by the coast. So the water used to cool it, traditionally, is seawater. Minister, who happened to be the brother of um, the vice president or so, I think, if my memory serves me right, went out and bought this turbine from a country that has fresh water facilities. Nepotism, corruption, bad, bad outcome. In the security sector, it could cost thousands, if not millions, of lives. I have be also be went to an, a, another country, um, purchased of equipment for training a military People went out, purchased equipment. I think over 40% of the weapons did not fire. You, ha you have to ask questions, because we generally think that corruption, large or small, really doesn't have consequences. But if you think about it, and you go through all these examples, and I can give you example after example after example, a lot of things that keep, to, keep holding African countries back, particularly in the management of the security sector, have some relationship, direct or indirect, with corruption. So there are some myths about corruption. Some people think it's all about corrupt officials and elites. No. It permeates society. Some think people think it's cultural. No. As uh, I think Colonel Dempsey mentioned, that, or someone mentioned, we all have an inherent knowledge of right and wrong. It's a choice issue. Some people say it's of little practical relevance. I gave you two examples. I can give you a lot more examples where your best security strategy could be compromised because of a decision made somewhere along the chain that was affected by corruption. So let me conclude. In a nutshell, corruption is basic, basically flourishes where people think they can get away with it where the anticipated gains exceed the anticipated costs. And I tried to break down from literature what anticipated gains would look like, i.e., how much you derive and how many times you can derive it, from anticipated costs, i.e., would I go to jail and would I be punished? And if you look at those four variables, how much revenue is derived, how often you have an opportunity to be corrupt, the likelihood of detection, and the cost of punishment, if you break it down that way, you could start thinking about practical things you can adopt in your strategy, your country could adopt, that would address one or more of these um, four variables. In terms of revenue, um, in terms of the, on, on the revenue side, um, expenditure tracking systems have worked in a number of countries, and I can talk a little bit more about those during the Q&A. Reducing discretionary authority is one. Um, uh, and one of my examples of discretionary authority is as a, an African country where the average business pays over 100 different taxes every year. Nowhere are those 100 dif different taxes written down. You only find out that you have not paid a tax when the tax collector comes and tells you you've owed this tax for 10 years. Opportunity for corruption. And reducing discretionary authority is an easy fix in most, in, in most, um, in most cases. Likelihood of detection, cost of punishment, I will not go into those. We can talk about them during the um, Q&A. Here are examples and from outside Africa of um, 
areas of countries that in the, that, 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 that um, took some of these practical steps to address corruption in the public sector and uh, some of the immediate benefits that um, accrued. Um, could African countries do it? Absolutely. A number of African countries have introduced um, public expenditure tracking systems in the social sector. It's working. We just need the political will to do it in the security sector as well. Um, we talk a lot about the secure, se secure sector being a little, a little special because things need to be confidential or secret. That's absolutely true. Even in this country, there are things that are confidential and secret. That's why, you, but you also need to have people who have clearance, classified clearance to exercise oversight. That something is classified doesn't mean that nobody audits it and nobody knows what's going on. There needs, you need to have mechanisms, both within the government and the parliament, to be able to have some oversight and conduct the audits. Because it's not just a matter of personal preference, or one person getting rich of the contract and the other not person getting nothing. It's a matter of the effectiveness of your security strategy and your national security um, posture. Here's one that you see in a lot of literature. You need to involve civil society. Um, it kind of finds its way into any report, any donor report these days because the donors like to see it and so we just write it in. Um, but as we write it into the strategy, let us think about what it means. Because civil society has a crucial role to play in recognizing, addressing, and rooting out corruption you know, across the board. Um, it's, not, and it's, it's not just something that you write because you like it. And in the um, late 90s, I worked at the World Bank, and we worked on um, external debt in heavily indebted countries. And in 97, 98, one of the things that they were trying to introduce was a mechanism to forgive debt. I'm sure most of you know about the HIPIC initiative. Um, we were one, I was part of the first team in the World Bank that put this together. One of the things that we required in exchange for forgiving the debt, we said that countries should tell us how they're going to spend the money on health and education that we're forgiving them for financial debt. And to lay out a strategy, to our surprise, the first two public, um, um, the first two um, poverty reduction strategies that came from African countries had a lot more conditionality in them than the IMF had ever imposed on those countries. Countries themselves put it in. Why? Because they thought that's what the donors wanted to see. And many times, the way how we treat involvement of the civil society is the same. We think, oh, it's something that needs to be in this document, so we'll just write a paragraph on it, but we don't take it seriously. But it needs to be taken very seriously because it is re it's, it's a crucial part of the whole dynamic. Okay, I'm not a rosy-eyed optimist on this. I'm saying we need to do this, we need to consider this, but I understand and appreciate that it is not easy. There are many challenges, because in many countries, impunity is the order of the day. People could be as corrupt as they want, and, they, and they, in fact, they seem to, be get, so to get rewarded for being corrupt. Okay, so when you have that environment, it's difficult to really think about, you know, what could we all do to address corruption? So that's why I say break it down. The four components I gave in an earlier slide are an example of a way you can break it down and find viable, practical, and non-threatening entry points. Second challenge is weak parliamentary oversight. We have some countries do not even have parliamentary oversight committees for the defense sector <laughs> or the security sector. Others that do have people that don't have a clue what a budget is or what even off-budget expenditure means or implies. So there's a huge challenge, not just in terms of sensitization, but also education 
of those charged with responsibilities to, uh, to um, exercise oversight. Um, we have, I've talk, talked about the secrecy thing. I talked about the um, high cost of um, whistleblowing. Um, very quickly in, in wrapping up um, the difficulties with external actors, um, you are going to have a lot of pressure to accept things, to do things. But again, look across the world. Every other country and region are pursuing their national interests. It's time Africa as well and African countries start pursuing their national security interests and the regional security interests. Thank you. Thank you.